when you're a businessman who has to make the business work. So why are so many so convinced that they know what's coming with Elon Musk at the helm? That it will be so bad or, or so good for that matter? Let's bring in New York Times reporter Lauren Hirsch, where she covers business policy and mergers and acquisitions. And Colby All, founding editor at Mediaite.com, which I founded. He's also a News Nation uh, contributor. Thank you both for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, Colby, let me ask you, because you've written about this. What are some on the left so afraid of when it comes to Elon Musk buying Twitter? That, that to get the level of reaction that we've seen. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, the clips really illustrate, well, the sort of mythology surrounding Elon Musk. And it exists on both sides of the political aisle, to be honest. But this portrayal of him as sort of this kind of um, not just a free speech boogeyman, but someone who is, is really wants the wild, wild west and will now allow sort of a lawless place for people to say or do whatever, whatever they want. And people are literally saying that it will lead to war without hyperbole. I mean, even Brian Stelter today on CNN, who's, who's left leaning but reasonable, he sort of uh, made the metaphor that would you want to go to a party where anyone at the party could say whatever they wanted to do or do whatever they wanted to do, that's not a party that you'd probably feel comfortable at. Yeah, but and there's nowhere in the press release or nowhere has Elon Musk said anything like that. So I think, you know, I think it's um, Elon Musk has become a caricature to both sides. And uh, as long as he's been in this conversation, the progressive side of the aisle has painted him in the worst possible light and convinced themselves that uh, the world is going to a hell in a handbasket and as a result of Elon Musk purchasing Twitter. Yeah, and, and Lauren Hirsch, I mean, it, Colby makes the point that both sides have sort of decided how he's going to, to deal with this, but isn't he a businessman first? I really don't even know the answer to this question because if he is, I would think that the most important thing for him is going to be, okay, what works, what doesn't, how can I further the business? How can I make, make more of a profit? How can I make sure people don't leave the platform, et cetera? One would think uh, he was at a TED talk right when the deal first got announced and he said he didn't, he wasn't, he, he did not want to buy this for profit. So it's actually unclear the extent to which profit uh, is his end game here. And you raise this point, Dan, but in the press release, there was no details about the business model, about the business plan, about what he's hoping to achieve here. I will tell you, I spent the day on the phone talking to people around the deal and I still don't really know what the plan is. And so I think what people are grabbing onto is the only thing he has offered effectively, which is this free speech concept. And so, you know, without the additional kind of context into what kind yeah. of business he's hoping to run, I think that is concerning to some people who don't think there's shackles around it, for lack of a better term. L Lauren, can you explain to us in, in really basic terms what it means that he may be changing the algorithms and how that could impact sort of user experience? So effectively, it enables you to personalize or individualize the news that you see on your feed. And that makes such a difference. It shapes your world. You know, the New York Times, my employer, we choose what's on the home page every day and what's on A1, the front page of the New York Times. And we think that's the most important news. And that oftentimes reflects how other people view what's the most important news. Well, Twitter is now where many people get their news. And so what they see first and what they're faced with shapes their worldview. And so what he wants to do, and this is something even Jack Dorsey, Twitter's founder, has spoken about, is allowing people to have the power to individualize um, what they see in a way that they think is kind of most effective for them. But isn't that what you can do on Twitter already? Yes, but it's Yes, but it's more complicated. It's more okay. Rich, yes. <laughs> All right, All right. Uh, but but Colby, you know, it just sounds to me like when we talk about free speech, we talk about uh, Elon Musk being more willing to allow people to say things, right? Not banning as many people, etc. It, it sounds to me like we're talking about Twitter circa 2015. I don't know. Well, I mean, it remains to be seen, and and I think. So Twitter circa 2015, uh, people would kind of check for that right now. Um, you know, I think this idea that, I mean, of course, there's going to be moderation. It will just be different moderation. There's no way that he's going to allow, you know, flat out hate speech, uh, speech or, you know, sort of threats of violence. And honestly, I think, you know, 
what's not been told here is I believe Elon Musk just purchased a massive headache because his purchasing uh, Twitter in this way is really made it about him and his cult of personality. And I guarantee you that the moment there's a massive Twitter controversy, which there will be dozens, it will immediately fall to his desk. Like, why did you allow this thing to happen? Whether it's from the left or the right, yeah. And I, I suspect Elon Musk will pretty immediately get tired of being held responsible for the actions uh, and statements and, made by people that he has no responsibility for. And I have to say that I think part of the conservative joy in this is seeing how upset liberals are. Meaning, because no totally. one actually knows what's going to happen. I think it's this sort of owning the libs, right? Which is, oh, all these liberals are getting all these things trending on Twitter about the end of the world, et cetera. And conservatives are like, well, then it must be good. This must, this right. means that we're winning. <laughs> I don't know if the conservatives are going to be pleased with the way it works out. And honestly, Trump has said he's not going to return to the platform. That would surprise me if he didn't. And I would also say the worst thing that he could do politically is return to the platform because he's done much better when he's flown under the radar. If he's tweeting all the time about everything, it's going to remind people about the guy that was around on January 6th. So it's, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's far from concluded how this will unfold. And it will be an interesting thing to watch yeah. and, and write I, about perhaps. I will, the media I, will, I, will I will predict that Donald Trump will be back on Twitter. Um, I've always <laughs> said that the idea of sort of a lifelong ban, I don't even know what that that means it's sort of like my, the, the lifelong subscription that Colby Hall bought to CNN Plus. Um, <laughs> Lauren exactly Hirsch right. and, and Colby Hall, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.